Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot here on the Typologetics YouTube channel with my wife May. It's been a while, we're a little late in uh, picking up our series. We've been looking at evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, we looked at direct evidence, now we're looking at less direct but critical uh, objective spiritual evidence we've been looking in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, before we return to that, let's uh, open with prayer. So, oh, Father, I thank you that you've provided the revelation of your will uh, in the scriptures and through your Son. Give us discernment in all the things that we consider in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, so what we were looking at, if you remember, was that we found, following the clue from Peter giving a witness in Acts and talking about uh, the 16th Psalm, uh, about uh, David talked about being uh, raised up from, from Sheol, from the grave, that uh, we discovered that David, Moses, uh, Joshua, Joseph, Jacob, uh, all those uh, men who uh, played a crucial role in furthering God's purpose endured a period of death-like exile from their people or from their land uh, before they, they, they fulfilled that function of uh, being a savior, liberator, establisher of Israel uh, in the land of, uh, of Canaan, in the case of Jacob. Uh, and th that set a pattern uh, that, uh, that was fulfilled finally in a very dramatic way in Jesus, that all along God was, as it were, bringing life out of death, out of death-like situations, including the exile of Israel itself. So uh, before we uh, uh, move forward with that, which we have some more material to consider, just wanted to sort of refresh ourselves about the importance of looking into the Old Testament. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, just to uh, remind us kind of of the appropriateness of uh, of looking at things like what we've what, what we've been uh, uh, studying the last few times. So First Corinthians fifteen, remember where Paul was talking about the message of uh, uh, the good news about Jesus. So may if you would read for us again uh, verses three and four of First Corinthians fifteen. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, you'll notice here that Paul Paul saying that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, uh, Paul probably does have some specific Scriptures in mind, it probably has in mind Isaiah uh, 53 uh, on the third day. He may have in mind what's called the Treasar, what we call the Minor Prophets. Those were treated as one book uh, in the, the st still are in the Jewish Bible. That is all those small prophetic books of Hosea through Malachi, and in that in those Minor Prophets we have. Jonah, the, the, the story goes, he was brought out of the fish on the third day out of uh, the, the, what he calls the grave or out of the belly of Sheol. Um, Hosea, in that, uh, also in the Minor Prophets, spoke about Israel in some sense being raised up on the third day. So Paul uh, has some specific texts probably in mind, but you'll notice that he doesn't actually go to any specific uh, texts. Uh, in the Old Testament. He, do, he doesn't cite them, he just says, according to the scriptures. And I think that that's an indication that, that Paul knows that there is much more than just the specific texts uh, that we might think of immediately behind this, that there are all kinds of ways in which Jesus filled out, fulfilled the entire uh, history of Israel we'll find there. Not just the scriptures here and there, uh, you know, uh, certain certain proof texts, but the whole pattern of the scriptures came to fruition in Jesus, and that's what we've been looking at. These cases of this of death-like exile or other death-like situations, Abraham and Sarah's uh, a reproductive deadness that then God brings life out of uh, Isaac, as good as dead on the altar, and so on. Uh, we might even turn back to the Gospels to confirm this. Let's turn back to John, 
and look in John chapter 5, uh, John's Gospel, and we in John will look at verse um, 39 of John 5. Uh, we'll look at 39 and then 46 and 7. So, May, if you would read, um, first of all, John 5, 39. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that uh, in them you have eternal life. It is this that testifies about me. Okay. And then skip down to 46 okay. and 7. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Okay, so you notice how Jesus hits this note that the scriptures testify about him, and specifically Moses. So that's the first five books of the Bible, are called the books of Moses. So Jesus says that Israel's uh, scriptures including the all-important uh, Torah or the Pentateuch, the foundation of the, the uh, Hebrew Bible and of the Greek version of that, the Septuagint. It's that the, the, the uh, Torah or, the, or what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books, are the foundation and that these testified about Jesus. So, it, and it's not, again, you could find little fragments like a, the, 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 that there was a, a prediction of a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy, but I think Jesus means more than that. He means a larger pattern of truth that they came together in him. Just one more. Let's look back to Luke chapter 24. And uh, let's look at in Luke 20, uh, 24 verse 44. And, and 44 and 44. 45. Okay. So. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Okay. So, see the same thing. Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses. So that's the first five books and the prophets. Those are all the, 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 the prophets include all the, what we, we would uh, normally think of as the historical writings like first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, uh, Joshua, all those were considered uh, prophets. And the Psalms and the Psalms headed in the Jewish Bible, the Psalms are at the head of what's called the writings, the last section of the Hebrew Bible. So he's saying from the uh, law of Moses all the way through to the uh, end of the uh, uh, end of the Jewish Bible. So the, the, if you look at the Jewish, uh, actually the, the, uh, the Jewish Bible ends with the book of uh, Second Chronicles. It's just the order of the books is different than we are used to uh, normally. It comes from the, the Greek translation of the Septuagint are the order that we see them in our English language Bibles. Um, so we might say a Genesis through Malachi, uh, you know, in the, in, in the terms of Jewish Bible, it would be Genesis through Second Chronicles. But in any case, that all of the Old Testament testified about Jesus. And we've seen this pattern. It goes all the way back to Genesis 1-1, where we see sort of a, a deep, abyss-like, grave-like condition suddenly enlivened in mid-verse by the introduction of the Spirit of God, and it becomes then... Uh, embryonic darkness is sort of the, we go from a tomb to a womb, as it were, in, in Genesis 1. So, when we think about types for Jesus, so in other words, characters which clearly had some typical role, and, and this would be in terms of the positive characteristics, like David, his positive characteristics, his faith in God, his courage, and so on, were uh, uh, models for the coming Messiah. The coming Messiah was even called a uh, David. He's called that in the Psalms and in the book of uh, Ezekiel. So we think about types. Many of these prominent figures we've been uh, discussing that had this, this period of, uh, of a death-like exile before they served that 
that powerful purpose in God's will, like Joseph and David and uh, Moses, that many of them were either explicitly or implicitly types for Jesus or are, are presented that way. So we read about, like I said, David is, 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 is directly called a model for the Messiah, son of David. Uh, also, that would be uh, Solomon. Also, just the term son of David implies a likeness to David himself. Uh, Moses, so we read in John 1 that, you know, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we, we find Jesus providing, uh, you know, bread to the crowd the way Moses provided or was, a, a you know, a, a, one of the channels that God used to provide for his people during their wilderness wanderings. Uh, that uh, manna came from heaven while they were under the, the leadership and guidance of Moses. So we, we find that Jesus is, is implicitly compared with Moses and many of these other uh, figures. There, you know, that, uh, the, like I said, there's a strong implication of their represent, representative role in terms of Jesus. So if we look at those that are presented that way, we find a, a couple that did not have this experience of enduring sort of a death-like uh, period of exile or other death-like experience that then they were enlivened, so to speak, out of by God. Now, one of them is Adam. So Adam serves uh, a, a positive, typical role for Jesus in that Adam is the father of the human race, and uh, Jesus becomes the father of a new uh, human race. So Adam, you know, Paul makes that comparison, that he's like the second uh, Adam. Uh, another one is Solomon. So Solomon did not have, uh, you know, one of these periods of exile or some kind of death-like uh, state, condition, circumstance that he was raised out of. Uh, and, and they're somewhat exceptional in, that, in those terms. But if you think about it, Adam and Solomon represent kind of two poles, as it were. So Adam, besides being the, the, uh, presented as the father of the human race, it's also true that he represents then in a negative way the fall into sin and alienation from God. So that, that, and we find God pursuing his purpose then through Abraham, through the uh, uh, nation of Israel through its various stages and the kingship of David. And finally, in Solomon, we get to something like a final uh, rest or uh, a, a, a period of sort of representative recovery from sin. Now, of course, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't really a full recovery from sin. The whole world wasn't blessed. Death was not done away with, obviously, during Solomon's reign. But the first part of Solomon's reign that was, uh, is presented in the Bible, and of course it's, it's presented in very heightened terms, we might say, in terms of that peace and prosperity. There was relief, there was rest from war. Uh, Solomon did not have to go out and fight wars as the scriptures uh, present it the way his uh, uh, father David did. Uh, there was this uh, wisdom with which he judged the nation. There was a, you know, a, a, a kind of a basic faithfulness that's implied of the way that uh, worship went on, uh, at least in that first part of Solomon's reign. We had a little representation of the Messianic kingdom in the first part of the reign of Solomon. So that's why I say that Adam and Solomon uh, were sort of uh, two kind of uh, poles of this arc of a representative or prophetic uh, portrayal of uh, salvation history. Um, so it's it's kind of natural that uh, that neither of them would have the characteristics of all these characters that that you know that came between them. But there are other uh, messianic <laughs> types beyond Solomon. So if we think about the major prophets. Think about the major prophets. Who, who's that? Isaiah, right? Okay. Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, each of them was sort of a messianic representative in a certain way. From a, and in fact, there's some overlap in them. But from, for example, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was 
prominent among those three for the proclamation of future comfort for Israel. Now, all of them did this. There's a there's a, a pro, there's a, a prophecy of comfort and restoration in Jeremiah. There's also one in Ezekiel. Yet, but it's Isaiah that has the most uh, uh, beautifully described. Let's put it that it's a beautifully described restoration. More detail about the comfort that's going to come to Zion and so on is in the book of Isaiah. All, the book of Hebrews says that uh, you know Isaiah personally, his children were given prophetic names. That he said, "I am the young children." were like uh, signs and witnesses to Israel. And uh, Hebrews says that that was true of Jesus and his disciples. So there's kind of a fulfillment of Isaiah's role as being a, a prophetic sign to the people. But it's really that uh, proclaimer of the good news of the comfort of Zion is the way in which Isaiah sort of had a, that a typical uh, role for Jesus. When we come to Ezekiel, Ezekiel was a, is prominently all through the book of Ezekiel is called son of man. So you remember in, in the Gospels, what's Jesus' favorite name for himself? Uh, the son of man. Okay, so Ezekiel was called the son of man. Ezekiel was known as someone who, uh, the, his book that's uh, named for him, Ezekiel, contains these parable stories these symbolic stories that tell parables about Israel's future. Like we, we had the example of the Valley of Dry Bones, right? And, and so it's kind of a parable in its original uh, uh, application. It's a parable that the nation will be restored. The nation will be raised from the dead, so to speak, when they come back from exile in Babylon to the land of Judah. So Ezekiel, as the parable-telling son of man, <laughs> Uh, is in that way typical of, of Christ Jesus, okay? So neither of those had sort of this into the grave and out of it experience. But the prophet of Jer the, the uh, a prophet Jeremiah, who's the, the other uh, uh, prophet of our three, what we call our three major prophets, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, he did have an experience. He was thrown into a pit. It was a, a, a well that had mire in the bottom, intended to be his grave. He was pulled up out of it. It's a little bit like Joseph's experience where he was nearly killed by his brothers and thrown into a pit and raised up out of it. So of the three, we do have one that did experience this kind of into and out of the grave uh, portrayal <laughs> that we find. And then of course, as we've said, when we get to the minor prophets, we have that, uh, that uh, story about Jonah coming into and out of the grave. So um, all through uh, the Hebrew Bible, we have this story of life out of death interwoven with other uh, typical characteristics that Jesus will fulfill, it's like king, uh, lawgiver, uh, the uh, uh, mediator, see Moses so it was, it was a mediator between uh, the people and God. He went up to the mountain, sort of close to heaven, and went back and forth uh, between God and the people, acting as a mediator. So uh, David as being the, the uh, uh, king, the defeater of uh, the forces of evil ranged against Israel. Uh, all of these have other respects in which they represented uh, Jesus in some way. And yet woven through them is this story of uh, life uh, being brought up out of death. So how did this come about? So in other words, if you're looking at this, remember, uh, if you're looking from a purely, uh, say, secular point of view, uh, a non-faith point of view, uh, the most uh, uh, rational, probably, or uh, common, uh, seemingly sensible explanation for Jesus' ministry is that Jesus really thought that God was going to accomplish a great deliverance through him. He thought that he would go to Jerusalem, he would experience opposition, God would then somehow provide some great, uh, uh, powerful, uh, you know, uh, uh, vindication of Jesus in the midst of this, 
confrontation that Jesus would have, and then he would be exalted onto the throne of David. That's sort of the, the uh, I think, the more popular uh, assumption of what Jesus was uh, up to and what Jesus ex uh, was expecting if you just look at secular historians evaluating his ministry. And as I said, that's because when we read in the Gospels, it seems that that's what Jesus' disciples were, that, that's what they were expecting. <laughs> in other words, when they followed him to Jerusalem, Jesus is shown as telling them, well, the Son of Man's going to be rejected, the Son of Man's going to die, and then he'll rise on the third day. But they were just not comprehending that at all. That wasn't, uh, they just couldn't wrap their minds around that. So what were they expecting? Uh, well, and, and we talked about this before, they were expecting that Jesus would somehow triumph in Jerusalem, not through force of arms, not, not through a military revolt, but through somehow God's vindication of him. That would, it would, it would come in some way, they didn't know exactly how, but they thought no doubt that that would happen and Jesus would end up on the throne of David and blessings would start flowing. Just to confirm that, if you remember, um, uh, I think last time, if we look at Luke chapter 19, so we get this because I'm going to relate this to what we've been uh, learning from the Hebrew scriptures here in a minute. So in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11 and 12, uh, May, if you would read that for us. While they were listening to this things Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately so he said a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return okay you can stop there so he, here's my point it says directly they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay, so if they thought it was going to appear immediately, in other words, uh, within what, days or you know, a short period of time after Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, this whole thing would come to a head and Jesus' vindication would come from God. So when it says the kingdom of God was going to appear, they thought that meant that the, the power of God being behind the king and who would the king be Jesus, of course. <laughs> so in other words, they felt that Jesus' vindication and his rulership would begin very quickly, very shortly, after they arrived in Jerusalem. And the, the premise here of Luke is that Jesus is trying to get them to understand that that's not the way uh, things are going to work out exactly. Because the next thing he says as he starts the parable, we're not going to read it, it's the a, a parable of the uh, minus here. It says, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. So in other words, he's saying, he's saying uh, this, this nobleman had to leave. And it's because it's a distant country that conveys that there's going to be a period of time before he can uh, return with kingly power derived from this distant country. And... Uh, I, you know, he's, he's trying to get them to begin to understand that Jesus himself will die, but he will return to the Father and then return later in kingdom power. And they're just not capable of, of, of fully comprehending this yet, but he's trying to give them the tools to understand that at the right time. So, but here's my point. If it was the case, let's imagine for a moment, that the disciples are on their way to Jerusalem, Jesus is leading them. Imagine for a moment that uh, Jesus himself was expecting a divine vindication, just for the sake of argument. He was expecting a divine vindication once he gets to Jerusalem and has the final confrontation with those who oppose God's will, you know, the religious leaders and so on, who don't listen to Jesus, who uh, reject uh, the, uh, uh, the miracles that he's performing, the teachings that he's given, they're rejecting of them. So he's going to get to Jerusalem, somehow be vindicated. But instead, Jesus ends up being uh, crucified. 
um, and that this was not was he, what he was expecting, say, you know, that's the, the assumption of, uh, of probably most secular historians, that Jesus was not really expecting to be crucified, but he was crucified. Um, his disciples are in shock, they're in grief, their expectations have been, you know, uh, completely uh, uh, overturned. Um, so, now, they begin to believe that they have seen Jesus risen from the dead. However you want to imagine that this happened, that they, they encountered strangers who behaved enigmatically and afterwards they were, that was really Jesus in disguise or something. However you want to, to try to put it together, that they, that it, they started to believe that they had seen Jesus alive after the day. Then, going back into the Hebrew Bible, we just happened to find that God's pattern of working is to bring life out of death, that that just uh, coincidentally happens to be this theme that we have to dig for, but we don't have to dig for it too far. Once we have the precedent of Jesus' resurrection, we start seeing it. When we said that these characters who endured this death-like exile, like Moses having to flee out of the desert for 40 years and herd sheep in Sinai, you know, before he can deliver Israel, we said that that exile is, is, is like a death to his people. Well, Ezekiel specifically says that Israel's exile, the time that, that Judah spends in Babylon, it represents that as death, dry bones, you know, on the ground. So, in other words, that's not us just using our imagination. Oh, well, you know, Moses and David's exile, that was sort of like a death-like. Well, no, the Bible defines that. It defines that uh, 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 sort of absolute exile from your people or from your land as being a death-like state and that a return, especially return to uh, triumphantly move forward God's will is like life out of death. That's not something we've just sort of through free association we've come up with. That really is definitely indicated once we have the clue to look for it, it's there. And we can't also go back and say that the disciples were seeing this pattern in advance mm -hmm. And then looking for Jesus to die and be resurrected. Everything would be against that. I don't think that any, you know, serious from, from Albert Schweitzer or to, to in our own time, Bart Ehrman, or these, uh, you know, uh, uh, historians who were uh, maybe, maybe some of them believers, but not necessarily having a real high view of the Gospels or however you might uh, uh, put it, that none of them believe uh, as far as I know, you know, that, that, that the disciples on the way to Jerusalem with Jesus were really expecting Jesus to die. Certainly the Gospels don't present it that way. They hadn't been conditioning themselves because of what they'd been reading in the Hebrew Scriptures to expect that. And everything we know from, as I've said, from our, the Jewish literature uh, leading up to that time and from a couple of centuries before Jesus came, 99.9% .9 of, of all that literature uh, looks at uh, messianic hopes as being of an immediate uh, conquest or a quick conquest uh, by the uh, Messiah of the enemies of Israel and blessings following, not a dying uh, Messiah who would then rise from the dead. It's just... In other words, it wasn't in the minds of the disciples. They weren't uh, conditioning themselves to it. Uh, certainly Jewish society was not. It was scandalous to even think, as Paul says, on the part of most Jews, that someone who endured this humiliating uh, public uh, death, and it was uh, that kind of death that by crucifixion was more raw and... Um, horrific than we uh, probably really have in our minds, you know, uh, to, to actually um, uh, look at, at that in real life up close would be tremendously, uh, uh, it, would, uh, it would shake a person to their very core, that, and that's the purpose of it. So the Jews definitely would not have that in mind as the picture of what their Messiah would do or would need to do. So what we have is the 
the resurrection of Jesus all of a sudden lights up the Hebrew Bible from back to front as if just a light has been turned on and we see this theme of God bringing life out of death, which would mean that the Messiah ultimately fulfilling God's purpose for blessing all the nations, for him to go through the most dramatic, most profound version of that uh, into death and back out of it again, uh, that experience suddenly looks like, in, it looks inevitable when it would have been thought, when it was unthinkable, the unthinkable became the inevitable once it actually happened and you could see it. And that is, in my mind, a supremely powerful as a testimony to uh, the reality of Jesus' resurrection. And we do have the context of the one God and the revelation of the one God. Uh, it, like I said, in the Hebrew Bible, we've got a lot of spiritual evidence all contributing to this larger picture we've been painting. So we'll have a little bit more to say about that before we move on. Uh, we'll be wrapping up this study finally pretty soon. We've been on a long time. We'll be moving to a new topic. But um, it's, been, it's been great to get to this point and, and look at it from every direction, so to speak. So our time's up and I look forward to that next time. So let's uh, close with prayer. So Father, thank you for uh, allowing us this time to uh, peer into uh, the scriptures. Please guide us by your spirit of truth until we're together again. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next time.